Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Stephen W. Long. This is The Writing Life, and we're going to continue uh, celebrating Poetry Month. And so today, uh, my guest is Courtney Terry. Uh, Courtney is the reference supervisor. Have I got that right? And really more than that, uh, uh, Courtney is instrumental in several events around town with writing. Uh, I, I know we've done some uh, prose. But really, now you kind of started this uh, the poetry night at uh, Ten Oaks, right? Um, okay. And th so the program originally started a few years ago, and at first we were at the Velvet Monkey Tea right. Room on Third Street. Sure. Um, and then the past year, actually January of 2017, we moved to the gallery at Ten Oaks um, over on Baker Street, right across from Lightfield. Right. Okay. And. I think probably unrelated to the move, but am I right that uh, attendance has just continued to, and participation has, has continued to grow? Yes, and it just, um, I say it surprises me, but I, I'm, I'm very kinda, happy. Kind of not? <laughs> yeah, kind of not. Um, how much it has grown, and yeah. I love, we have a wonderful group of regulars that come every month, yeah. and then there's also always new people that stop by right. um, so it's it's wonderful because you kind of hear from regulars each month yeah. but then there's always a new voice that wants to come and share yeah so a couple of things about that I know I was at the last one with Lynn Otto yes and and it was actually my first time so is there a um, like a a designated poet and then open mic is that how that works yes and so mm -hmm. I, I like to find a featured poet um, usually a That's published I mean. poet yeah um, and I if I can find someone in Yamhill County which there is no shortage right. um, I do and then occasionally I like to branch out and we've had folks from Salem or Corvallis or oh. even Portland have come down okay um, and so we have the featured poet uh, just to kind of get things started and then we open it up for open mic and sure you have a lot more poetry for that, yeah. that way as well. Uh, when I told a friend that I was going to go to that one last time, uh, she said, you know, pretty soon they're going to have to find a new venue because it's getting pretty packed. Yes. Um, I, we're really excited, actually. Our, when we first started in the room, we actually, um, so we're kind of facing, um, I'm not sure what direction it is, mm -hmm. but facing El Primo. Okay, sure. And yeah. then the after a few times, um, we actually had to switch the orientation of the room so that we could use the doorways that are in the oh. building <laughs> so that we could kind of have sure. more. Um, but a, a standing room poetry night is an amazing thing. And I, I was going to say, who to guessed it? Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> and the space itself, um, so it used to be movie time video, the house there, right. and it's still owned by the same folks, Dan okay. and Nancy Morrow, and they've converted it into this art gallery, but it's also, it's just this gorgeous old house. So it has the yeah. windows and the doorways and all. The uh, pillars, right, inside, yes. yeah. And it's just, it has so much personality in itself, and then to turn it into an art gallery and right. have this creative space, uh -huh. I, it's just been wonderful. Okay, what a great segue, because isn't there a, a combination or a, a, a synchronicity between art and poetry? Yes. We've, okay. Um, so we have a program, we've, we've done it a about quarterly. Okay. Um, it's called Paintings to Poems. And what we do is we invo invite folks in and we, we time them. We give them an oh, hour. Oh, really? Okay. Um, which is very different from our open mic nights where people can come prepared with something that they've written themselves. Right. But um, the term is um, ekphrastic poetry, which is basically we invite people to walk around the gallery, find a piece of art that inspires them, and then they sit down and they have an hour to write a poem oh. about that particular work of art. Okay. Um, and we, we give them a little cheat sheet so they have an idea, but it's basically, you know, imagine what the artist was thinking when they were painting this. Imagine if the painting was real life, what, what's going on. Imagine how the featured thing or person or animal in the painting is feeling. Okay. And so we give them all these prompts and it's just kind of a, a different way to get those creative juices flowing and having it be timed also adds a little bit of fun with that pressure. Yeah, and I think sometimes it helps focus. <laughs> I think Definitely. if you have all the time in the world, sometimes it's not your best work because right. there's always later. Yes. Yeah, so you're pushed a little bit. Or there's always edit. I can just edit and right. edit, and you end up changing and kind of losing 
kind of that spontaneous yeah. aspect of it. Um, and the coolest thing that Dan and Nancy have done is once we have someone write a poem about a painting, they print it out and they put it up next to the painting. Okay. So people who come to the gallery afterwards will see a work of art and then they'll see this painting right or this poem right next to it related to the painting. What would happen if there were two poems or five poems? I mean, are they all up there or is there like a winner or? It's so far, we haven't had anyone do more than one okay. one painting, but I, that's a good question. Yeah. I do know um, there was a work of art someone did a painting for and it sold. <laughs> when it sold, the the painting went, the poem went with the painting. Sure. And that's what it was. I mean, the the buyer was delighted to have this kind of extra work of art to go with their work of art. Right. Um, and then there's been a few times at these programs where the artists have come and been there, and so they're able to hear right there somebody's <clears throat> poetic interpretation of their artwork and yeah. it's just a really cool experience both for the poet and for the artist to get that like kind of instant feedback i think um probably with any artistic endeavor the artist does their best mm -hmm. and then when they release it it's not theirs anymore and i know that this happens in prose and i'm just sure that it happens in poetry and fine art and so on and that is Somebody will interpret it, and then the creator will say, nah, "I don't think so." <laughs> uh, that's that's. But I mean, they don't say that. But I think that they're thinking that. Right. And uh, I'm, there are lots of fun examples. Of, a friend of mine, uh, who, who's an author, was giving a talk one time, and somebody in the audience said, "You know, I really like the metaphor of the protagonist walking through the carnival, and then when they took the hammer." and hit the, the bell, then that stood for whatever it stood for. And my friend was smiling and nodding, and she said later, it's just a bell. <laughs> 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 but, you know, if it means something to you, then it does. Right, and yeah. I think you don't, I mean, when you're writing and you have kind of that focus about what you're trying to say, sure, you, you don't even think about that. And yeah. it's like you almost learn something new about your own art, in a way. Yes. Um, I wrote a story one time where the protagonist drove a, a convertible, not a convertible, a station wagon. And months later, I, I sort of had a revelation. I thought, that's a hearse, because he's mourning the, the loss of his sister. And so, I don't know, I mean, was that subconscious or was it coincidental? I don't know. Yeah, but somebody came up with that. So, you know, something that I've wondered about you, really, because you're involved in the poetry, and you kind of did a prose thing, or maybe you still do a prose thing. Um, do you guys at the library sit around and say, hey, we got to do something, what will we do? Or do you just think, you know what would be cool? Let's do this. Um, a little bit of both. Oh, okay. Uh, we, so at the library, we have quarterly planning meetings. Okay. where we plan um, three months in advance. Okay. So we're actually, um, pretty soon we're having a meeting where we'll sit down and we'll plan all of our summer activities. Which right. it, it gets kind of funny sometimes because we'll be planning, um, we'll be doing our like winter programming in the middle of August sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll be starting our, our uh, summer reading program, which is really one, the biggest event um, at the public library since during the summertime we just have so many more folks that are coming in and we've got our okay. um, the children's reading program is probably the biggest thing I was going to ask about that I would think that summer would be the, the, the kids would be the focus yes it is definitely the busiest busiest time for us at the library okay. um, but then so so we do kind of go into it and say you know what ideas do we have and we'll brainstorm that way but then also sometimes I'll get a phone call or I'll have somebody oh. approach me about a program and um, say yes that's a great idea let's make it happen okay um, but I, I try not to I try not to do too many of those with a I try to leave a little turnaround time well you seem very busy and I know that it's kind of an, an uh, after hours we do um, the, our library after dark programs have been really they're they're so much fun to plan and then they've been really great just with 
okay. the folks that have shown up. And we, what I like about those is they're they're really flexible. Um, so in the past, when we host, we kind of put any program for adults that we have after the library is closed has okay. become kind of a library <clears throat> after dark. Um, last summer, we had Natalie Fletcher, who is an artist who's now living um, in the West Valley. She was the winner of season one of a, a reality TV show called Skin Wars. Really? And she, um, it's, she, it's amazing. Um, she just, she paints on the human body to match a background. And most of her paintings are um, like So nature. is it like camouflage? Yes. But <clears throat> she can, so what she did um, is she, came to the library after dark. She had a model. She had a piece of art that was already painted on a piece of canvas. And she basically stood the model in front of the piece of canvas <laughs> and painted just from, I'd say, the neck up, painted the face of the model to perfectly match right. the background. And in the process, she talked about, um, she took questions from the audience. She talked about the process. She talked about being on a reality TV show. And that was a really, really cool program. Mm -hmm. um, then that same summer, we had a woman who wrote a book um, called Inconceivable. And it was um, kind of a tongue-in-cheek look at um, women in the Victorian era and kind of the nittier, gritty things. Um, and what, was that Therese O'Neill? Yes, Therese yeah, O'Neill. Yeah. Yes. And so she was a hoot. I had her on the show. She was fantastic. Yeah. Yes. She is so funny. <clears throat> and you can hear that humor in her writing and then in person it just came out. And so that was so, you know, having these two kind of completely different programs, right. but still being able to have them. Um, we like to have them in the library silent room after dark since it's it's just kind of a cool atmosphere to okay. be in the library after everything's closed. Well, I think participation would be better because if people work, you know, right. it's going to be hard to, to get in there. Yeah, and just kind of that, it's, it's, it's special. It's a special time to be in the library. Yeah, okay. You know something else I wanted to ask you? <laughs> and maybe I did before because you've been on the show before. But uh, are you a writer? Not recently. Okay. Um, I... I wanted to be a writer when I was a kid, and I, I did a lot of writing. Actually, I, um, I don't think I ever applied for paper gardens, but they used to have, oh, I can't remember what it was called, but they would have a district writing festival for elementary school students every year. Oh, district, okay, yeah. Um, and I can't remember what it was called, but I would usually attend that. Um, but I think that's what happens sometimes is you grow up and kind of other things capture your attention. and. You may come back to it. I, I hope I come back to it. I have one thing I will say about the Poetry Nights is it is it's so inspiring um, to hear other people reading their work. And it, it, it gives you ideas. Not so much like, oh, he wrote a poem like that. I want to write a poem like that too. But <coughs> it just kind of as you're thinking like, oh, well, that's a really interesting way. Because you can write an amazing poem about something really mundane. Something that you would say like, oh, well, it's really boring to talk about that. But it, if you have a poem that with emotion and with the right kind of descriptions sure. you know you can turn something really mundane into poetry yeah. and I, that's really inspirational to me uh, my wife and I attended <clears throat> uh, we went to McMinniman's I think it was last week and uh, I'm, again I don't know how they select people but there were a couple of musicians there mm -hmm. and I get a kick out of being that close to somebody performing and and I get that same feeling it's not I can't play the guitar, mm -hmm. but I want to go home and write something because it's it's a creative. I, I watch them create, and I want to go create. Exactly. And I think the the poetry is something like that. And I wanted to say also, sort of relative to you or or to anybody who is thinking this way, uh, boy, when I was in college, I I wanted to be a writer, and and in fact, I wrote some things that were absolutely horrible, <laughs> and it was so embarrassing. And I thought, well, you know, I just I want to be a ball player, but I can't do that either. So uh, years passed, and then there, there came a time, which I'm still amazed that it took me so long, but I thought, gee, I wonder if I could go to class and learn how to do this. And, and so then I felt like I did. So it, it's not, well, in fact, as his name is going to escape me now, but the fellow who uh, wrote A River Runs Through It. Oh, uh, I think, Duncan? No. 
Come on, folks, help us out. I, <laughs> <laughs> I can picture the... Yeah. yeah. Oh. Well, we'll get it. We'll get it. But, <laughs> but the point is, uh, I think he was 70 when he published that. Oh, wow. And it was his first published piece. Oh, wow. And it's just gorgeous. It's just gorgeous writing. So, never too old. No. Okay, so <clears throat> this is about poetry. Mm -hmm. um, we talked about t uh, Ten Oaks, and, and we also earlier talked about that you're not directly involved in paper gardens. No, but it's, I'm a very avid supporter okay. of paper gardens. Yeah, and I know that the library is, in fact, we're probably past time now, right, to, for submissions. Right, the entries were due on yeah. March 1st. Okay, but uh, you offered the library as a drop-off point so that people could, at the last minute, they could still do that. Right, well, and I think it was a little scary for folks because the deadline was March 1st, but the um, it was they had to have been received by March 1st. Oh. And so f folks that maybe went on February 28th and put it in the post office, it um, I think it was making some people nervous. And sure. so just having a place where you can physically drop, say, okay, like this is here, this will yeah. get to the right and person. And that counted, I, am I right? Because yeah. you received it, even yeah. though you're not paper gardens. Right, and yeah. that was, we got a call from the paper gardens folks just right. asking if we could do this, and uh, yes, absolutely, we we're yeah. really happy to. We, a uh, couple of weeks ago, talked to Deborah Weiner oh, yeah. and, and Mike Santanay, and uh, boy, they've been so terrific to keep this thing going. And you know, it has been a long time, and I don't remember now, what, uh, is that 2004 maybe she wrote that? Yes. And uh, <clears throat> uh, to have been sustained for that long without, I would say, a strategic plan, maybe. Uh, and uh, Mike was talking about that, that it's kind of fits and starts and, and stumbled along. And But to somebody who's just observing, it seems mm -hmm. like, oh, they've got it all under control. Absolutely. I know, <laughs> definitely. Yeah. So we kind of talked about you reading this. Would you sure. be willing to do that? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, this is uh, a poem by Rachel Bouchard. Mm -hmm. who was the originator of Paper Gardens, and in fact, you'll hear where the line Paper Gardens comes from. Yeah. So the poem is called <clears throat> Nemesis. So, scorn my fanciful rambling, I'll map trails to Celestia. Mock my dreams, I'll mold bricks of visions. Pity my loneliness, quick tears will fill singing brooks. Burn my paper garden, cool camellias will rise from the flames, and lyrics bloom like suns to light us to the gates. Yeah, nice. It's beautiful. Uh-huh. <laughs> <clears throat> I th think I was uh, maybe originally attracted to poetry. Um, I was, a as a younger person, I had a hard time sustaining a thought in, this, in the sense of if you're going to write a novel, um, how do you keep that going? And so short stories maybe came a little easier and, and poetry easier than that. But the other thing is, uh, I don't know that I made this up, but I'll take credit for it. <laughs> I think uh, poetry is distilled language, and you, and you just you just still out, distill out all of the anything that's extraneous, and every word is so important. Uh, it can also be so personal, yeah. and there's nothing wrong with that. But I think if you want to disseminate, it depends on why you're you're writing it. If you mm -hmm. if you're writing it to share, then I think it has to be somewhat accessible or they don't get it. Yes. Yeah. Or they pretend to get it. <laughs> yeah, gee, that was swell. <laughs> and that's um, what actually, so our, our last featured poet we had at Poetry Night, um, Lynn Otto. Yes. Um, somebody in the audience asked a question after her reading, um, which was when, when she was reading to the group at Ten Oaks, she would give a little explanation, like, oh, this poem is about this, or, oh, I was right. thinking about this. And someone in the audience asked, you know, well, so what's the difference for you between reading your poetry out loud and having it in the book? And yeah. she said it, it came down to being able to explain when she's reading out loud to an audience, you can take that time to explain and say, this is what I meant by this. Okay. Whereas when, if you're reading in a print book, the poet's not going to be there to explain, right. oh, that's what that means. It's, it's, a lot of it's left up to just your own interpretation. Yeah. And so I think, I mean, that's probably one thing um, 
I, I love reading poetry, but I, I will not pretend I understand everything I read or what the poet yeah. meant to say. So, and that's what I love about the readings, at, like the live poetry readings, is because you can kind of get right. that inside view on what the poet was thinking when they were writing. Yeah. So I would say two things about that. One, and I've mentioned this before, uh, I was in a group with a, a woman, uh, Susan Parker, mm -hmm. who has since moved away, but I just loved her work. And very often I didn't get it. And so my critique was, I love your work and I don't get it. <laughs> and, and she had some quote that I, escapes me, but the gist of it is, uh, you don't have to get it. No. If it moves you, that's okay. Right. Yeah. And the other thing that I would say about that, because you talk about the author being there, I was in a writing group and uh, I remember somebody read something for our consideration and uh, <laughs> all of us said, well, that, that doesn't really make sense because I don't remember. Where did the gun come from? Or, gee, they weren't on the train a minute ago or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. And then so she launched into this long explanation well, if you weren't here, right. well, nobody would know that. Right. <laughs> so uh, there comes a point, and per, I think maybe particularly in prose, you have to write it down. Yes. It has to be in the work right. to, to find it. Or at least have a really good title to yeah. your poem. <laughs> I, well, yeah, to give you some direction. I uh, read a, a, a book actually by Thomas McGuane, mm -hmm. a friend gave me, and uh, I liked his early work. But it gets so obscure, in fact, I'll just say this, he is uh, trying to win back a love. And he's a very, he's an eccentric, he's kind of a washed up uh, musician, mm -hmm. and he's, his behavior is very erratic. And so he goes to her house and nails his hand to the door. Ooh. Well, my friend wanted to know what I thought of this book. And I said, I don't like it. And I don't like it because when I read uh, prose, I, I want to be able to see it. Mm -hmm. Well, visualize, how do you nail your hand to the door? How do, how, do you hold it? I don't know. Right. It just, <laughs> so that's a case where it, it didn't work for me. Mm -hmm. And I know that's not a good critique, but it didn't work for me. No, well, and I, I think it's, um, when I was younger in college, one of my, I, I loved... Hunter S. Thompson. Oh, sure. Um, and I, I still own all of his books. But even going back now and kind of reading parts of it, I mean, the entire idea behind Gonzo's journalism was it was just stream of consciousness writing. Right. And a lot of it doesn't make sense. And you're reading, you know, drug fueled rantings right. of a very smart man. But they're still drug fueled ranting. Nevertheless, yeah. And I mean, I guess I would apply that a little bit to um, I reading Kerouac's poetry, or sure. Um, although I do have to say, uh, Richard Brodigan is one of my favorite poem poets mm -hmm. ever. But what I love about his work is that there is no sense to it. I mean, I think one of my favorite poems he talks about um, at three a.m. Uh, fart smells like a avocado and a fish head and then in his poem he's like I got up at 3 a.m. without my glasses on to write this down and that's his poem and it's just it's so it's so bizarre but it's also I, I, there's just something about it that is so just weird <laughs> well and in the end I think all art is subjective yes so you take William Carlos Williams and and the uh, is it the red wagon has such significance, which I, I think is generally regarded as brilliant and lovely. Mm -hmm. And you take something else, and I think it's self-indulgent, and it's dumb. Mm -hmm. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's very much, it's, it's what, you, you know, like the poet really, once they put something out there, they really have no say in how someone interprets it or what yeah. someone may think about their we, work. We've come full circle on yes. that one. <laughs> so I, I'm going to, we've got a couple of minutes. I'm going to read something. And uh, they, you talked about your favorite poets. Ted Kuzer is one of my favorite poets. Oh. And uh, he was Poet Laureate. And I, not always, <clears throat> but uh, often 
his work is real accessible. I mean, I can understand it, and, and it, it's, uh, it, that doesn't mean that it's not deep or it's not lovely, but it's, uh, it's just you can understand it. Mm -hmm. And I was reading this a uh, couple of nights ago, and I periodically pick up this book and go through it. But this one strikes me as um, profound, maybe, uh, lovely. And I think also the, the fact that he's obviously a guy and writing from a woman's point of view. Oh. This is the tattooed lady. Around the smallpox vaccination scar I'd hated since I was a little girl, I had him put this daisy. Then its stem because the flower looked too spidery without a stem. And then these little flowers. He said to think of it as just a gift for a pretty girl. I went to him that night because my arm was swollen and I stayed 20 years. Around the daisy stem, he slowly wound a snake that circled me with, with swirls of trailer camps and cheap hotels and sideshows. Yet I loved the masterpiece that I became to him. His touch had touched me everywhere. His love is here to see. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. And I want to put in a, a plug. Uh, Barbara Drake, who yeah. is uh, our local, I think, poetic hero. Agreed. Uh, uh, she has a couple of books out, but uh, Driving 100. <clears throat> I would, I, 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 first page, I read the, and, I, and I think, oh, I want to call Barbara, because I had that same experience. And then you go to page two, and oh, yeah, and I can relate to that. And maybe I said uh, approachable, but maybe it's relatable. Maybe that's what I mean, that, that I love that so much. You can find some way to connect to it. Sure. And uh, again, I, I get a little irritated, I think, when w things are so personal that um, to the poet, um, maybe they're feeling something, but I don't know what it is. What, what is art for? If art is, for, is to communicate and they're not communicating, maybe that's what I'm, irritates me. And it's, I... It's funny, I can, sometimes we'll have somebody come to the, our poetry nights and they do have a poem and you can just tell it is so sure. emotional for them. I mean, we've had people cry at the poetry oh, yeah. nights and um, I consider myself to be a bit of an emotional sponge. So if there's someone else that's crying or sad or angry, I, I feel it. <laughs> yeah. um, but just how powerful it is and in a way it, it's, it's just so intimate. Like, see, when you have somebody that is expressing so much emotion and you right. can see it and you can hear it, you almost wonder, like, should, should I be listening to this? Like, is right. this something that's really too private right. for a public audience? But I, I think that's what poetry, especially emotional poetry like that, is great for. It's kind of pushing our boundaries and getting a little outside our comfort zone. But it allows us to connect to somebody right. in an emotional way. Um, I think I've said this before on the program, but uh, in my critique class, when I joined the class, uh, a woman had just lost her husband. And uh, so there were months of poems expressing sorrow and loss and so on. And a, one of the critiques one night was from another woman. She said, uh, these are lovely, and I'm so sorry you have to write them. But I think she, uh, I think she did have to write it, and I think that's uh, well. We know that it's cathartic. Um, people in the area here may know uh, Gunny, Brandon, mm -hmm. and I think that was a. Uh, actually, he was in the group that I'm now in at different times. Oh. Uh, I met him later, but uh, uh, I think that was a, a healing for him to get this stuff out somehow. And that's um, when we, our, so our poetry nights first started because I had a um, a veteran okay. come in. Um, he was a Vietnam War veteran, and he had all these poems that he had written. Oh boy! And he needed he wanted to share them. He wanted someone else to hear. Sure. And that was kind of the catalyst for what later became our poetry night series was just somebody reaching out, somebody wanting to share yeah. their poems with with anyone who would listen. And, and, and thankfully there was somebody to listen. Yes. Yeah, that's good. Um, anything that people should know? 
So we are having uh, our poetry night. We're switching it up a little bit in April. Okay. Normally it's on the first Thursday of the month, but um, on April 5th, um, the Linfield Library is actually having a, a slam poet okay. come to do a reading at the Linfield Library. So we've moved our poetry night to April 12th, which is the following Thursday. Okay. Um, and it's a bilingual poetry night. So yeah. um, we'll have Jose Angel Aragus from mm. Linfield. We'll be hosting that. Um, we'll hopefully have some Linfield students and okay. anyone else. Um, we say bilingual and uh, we said, you know, thinking Spanish, but really it could be any of sort course. of bilingual. Cambodian. Um, yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think the, the more the better. Um, and that also ties into our, our Mac Reads program, which is going on right now. Okay. And am I right, uh, uh, Jose is going to be at Terroir as well? Yes. Yeah. And he um, he's an excellent poet, and he's been, since he started at Linfield last fall, he's just been so great. Um, he wants to be involved with the poetry community. He... He has this, um, he's just amazing at kind of talking to his students. And so since he's been helping, we've had a lot more Linfield students yeah. um, attending, which is kind of what, at the public library, we always like to, you know, it's for the greater McMinnville community, sure. and Linfield's part of that. And so yeah. it's also great uh, to have some of those younger voices represented as well. Uh, with uh, Paper Gardens, uh, when I've attended, one of the things that w w was so... Um, gratifying mm -hmm. is the participation of uh, young students yes. and and they're 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 good and they're proud and and what a great exposure to that yes and yeah. going to the award ceremony and listening to them right you know and for a lot of them like getting up in front of a giant crowd of people and reading their poetry you know that might be the first time sure and uh, that's just I'm, it's such a cool experience and i'm so <laughs> glad that we have paper gardens this is a cool town I think so too. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, is, all done? Is that you? Okay. Sure. So, folks, thank you so much for watching. Um, again, you can contact me, stephenwlong.com. Um, go to the library, stop by and say hi to Courtney. And uh, I guess we'll see you next time on The Writing Life. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>